Okay, um, so where are we at? Well, we are at a very, very interesting time. And, you know, it, it's fascinating to see the speakers evolve. I mean, I've been listening to some of these speakers for a number of years and, you know, watching their journey as they evolve and... It's a phone somewhere. As they evolve and, and they build the jigsaw for themselves and they build the bigger picture. And, and you're doing the same, of course. You know, you're building up the picture. And, you know, so some of the things that uh, people were talking about 10, 15 years ago and were dismissed as absolute rampant conspiracy theory, you know, and now we see it in plain sight. And the establishment, of course, works on the basis that all they've got to do is keep saying, no, there's nothing to see here. Keep moving along. You know, I mean, anybody who suggests that there's a game plan to destroy the NHS must be completely deluded. Yet Jeremy Hunt wrote a book in 2005 about privatisation of the NHS. So he's put into the role to effectively carry out a blueprint that he helped draft 12 years ago. Yet it's a rampant conspiracy theory. You know, doctors are leaving in droves. Nicola is a classic example. You know, she graduated as a midwife a couple of years ago. And she loves the work, finds it obviously incredibly demanding. She's at Royal Barks, one of the busiest um, maternity wards in the country, um, one of the most challenging maternity wards because of the ethnic mix of the area, and uh, it has been forced to effectively leave the NHS payroll and go on to NHS Bank which is, I'm sure anybody here working for the NHS will be familiar with what I'm talking about, which is effectively where you leave the NHS payroll, but then you still have access to the shift system. Oh. So instead of being told which shifts you're going to work, you get to choose. And your salary increases by about 40%. So it's a no-brainer. It's an absolute no-brainer. So. Uh, the night shifts, obviously, are extremely demanding. So Nicola's working two night shifts a week, has a couple of days off, and then does a couple of day shifts. And then she's back into the, the routine the following week. So actually, on the way here, she was really messed up because she was still trying to adjust from the night shift to the day shift. And she really wasn't well for the first uh, you know, 24 hours that, that we were here. Now, that's just adjusting the clock. And she's literally counting down now the number of night shifts that she's got to do before she completely gets off that system. So, you know, the NHS is effectively putting in place, or the government is putting in place, all of the necessary motivation for people to leave the NHS, to deliberately undermine it, to destroy it, and force people onto private health care. And, of course, we're, where we're heading with this and I know this because I read what Jeremy Hunt wrote in 2005, where we're heading is exactly the same type of system that exists in the US. Where healthcare basically only comes with employment. And less and less employers actually are providing full healthcare in the US now, you know, just providing a basic cover. But one of the attractions of being part of the corporatocracy in the US was the fact that you had full health care coverage. If you didn't have your company's cover or you didn't have your private cover, which is incredibly expensive, or there's an incredible excess that you pay every time you want to go see a doctor. But if you don't have that, then basically, I mean, there are some cities that have charity hospitals, and funnily enough, you know, they're a magnet for people that are suffering from sort of ongoing conditions. But basically, these hospitals will literally leave you on the trolley to die. And the attitude in this country is moving towards the nth degree corporatocracy. And that is that unless you are on the corporate payroll, you are effectively a waste of space. You have no economic value, apart from your organs, but you have no economic value. In fact, you're a parasite on society. This is the depths to which we have sunk in this country. We have zero 
social conscience. And I am going to make a statement that I, you know, uh, is probably one of the strongest political statements I've ever made. Anybody voting Tory in this coming election has somehow lost their moral compass and is completely devoid of social conscience. I have never in my life encouraged people to vote Labour. And you know what? It still almost sort of sticks around here, <laughs> I have to say. But this election that's coming up is really the last opportunity, the absolute last opportunity that we have to stem this rush towards the rampant corporatocracy. And I'm choosing my words carefully because I could interchange that with rampant fascism. Because that's what the definition of fascism is. It is government controlled by the corporations. Nothing more. People have a connotation of fascism based on obviously Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy. But the US is a fascist state where the corporations have priority over the citizen. And that was proven in Texas a couple of years ago, where some of the communities in West Texas had not had water coming out of their taps for over two years because the water was being abstracted from the aquifers for fracking. And these communities took the US government to court and the courts ruled that the corporations had priority over the citizen. And it's been a similar case in Dimmock in, uh, in Pennsylvania, where basically the, um, the state tried to uh, block an attempt by the community to sue the state. They promised to let put in a, uh, a, a pipeline to overcome the problem of the contaminated water. Um, got to the elections, um, the Republican Party effectively had control of the state, and then they said, oh yeah, about that pipeline, maybe one day, but not right now. So once again, the community is just left to suffer. And of course, nobody knows about this because the media is so tightly controlled in the US that it is localized. So people in an immediate community that know there's a problem, they see it reported in the paper, and they go, well, that's it, at least it's in the paper. Yeah, but it's in their local paper. People 30, 40 miles away have no idea what's going on. <coughs> Believe it or not, during the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster, which was seven years ago now, during that disaster, apart from the people on the immediate Gulf Coast, everybody else in the US thought it was all done and dusted by mid-May because the media wasn't reporting it in the US. There wasn't much reporting here either. But this is how you know, the, the mindset is controlled, through limiting the flow of information. So here in this country, you know, it's a case of the new speak, as we saw so brilliantly portrayed by the party representative of the New World Order, who opened the conference for us. There's the new speak, and then there's the evidence. And they work on the basis that they could show you an apple and tell you it's an orange, and the significant chunk of the population would go, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course it is. My mistake. They will literally take what is said. And they also know, of course, and George Bush perfected this, um, all you've got to do is keep repeating stuff. You know, strong and stable. Strong and stable. Strong and stable. So, you know, the, the repetition... It's the zombie-type repetition of this is, you know, clear part of their strategy. And society is very much dividing. And I talked uh, in my uh, various introductions about the, uh, the way in which the media is starting to, uh, to collapse. And that is because more and more people are seeing the British Bullshit Corporation for exactly what it is. The sad thing is that there are still a significant number of people who don't. And the difference between Soviet Russia in the dying days of the Soviet Empire is that people used to openly ridicule what was being pumped out by Pravda and the Russian TV stations. 
Here, there's an increasing percentage of the population that ridicules what's being pumped out by the BBC, but unfortunately, there's still a significant chunk of the population that take it as gospel. But the balance is really quite close now, interestingly. Interestingly. And I think what absolutely shocked the British government and the British establishment was the magnitude of the Brexit vote last year. By the way, I, after last year, um, if you remember my presentation, I spent half of it focusing on the EU agenda. And in particular, the EU agenda to um, destroy the national homogeneity of European states, the kudenhove kalergi agenda. Anyway, um, I had this sort of flash of uh, inspiration, if you like, and um, I asked Matthew if we could very quickly edit that half of my presentation and get that up on YouTube before the EU referendum. And we actually got it up, I think, on, the, uh, on about the 1st of June. The referendum was on the 22nd, wasn't it, thereabouts? So three weeks. In that three weeks, that video was viewed over a quarter of a million times. So, you know, it, it, it's fine. <laughs> latching onto the zeitgeist of the moment. But I mean, if we were able to raise a little bit of awareness about the Kudenhof Kalergi agenda and get people to see that, you know, just because you wanted Brexit didn't make you a racist. And that's what they had to resort to, to try to resort to, to demonize the people who wanted out of the European Union, who were the critical thinkers. You know, the anecdotal evidence from various surveys actually suggests that the real exit vote, the Brexit vote, was in the region of about 70%. But that would have been such a slap to the establishment there's no way they could admit to that. So they went to, oh, well, it's going to be 51.8% versus 48.2% or whatever. So a narrow victory. And sadly, of course, the other part of what I was saying in that presentation was that I suspected that the result would be that we would come out, but that the agenda would be to use that as an opportunity to deliberately destroy this country. And UK Column, of course, does an excellent job of literally providing a diary of how the country is being destroyed whilst telling the people through the British Bullshit Corporation that it isn't. And of course, the classic example is, is the military and the EU military integration with the systematic destruction and effectively eradication of an independent British forces. It's why the likes of Rolls-Royce, the stock price of Rolls-Royce and the stock price of British Aerospace is, I wouldn't say wallowing, but it, it's not doing very much at the moment because traditionally these are companies that have taken a significant chunk of revenue from contracts given by the MOD, the Ministry of Defence, to provide the infrastructure, the hardware for the British forces. But that's gone. That's gone. Those contracts are not being awarded. So what's happening is that these companies are being forced, forced, you know, it's, it doesn't take much uh, twisting of arms. If you lose your domestic market, what do you do? So where does the British arms industry sell most of its products today? Israel. Israel. Yeah. So the UK arms industry is uh, putting eight billion pounds worth of product to Israel. You look at that, the second um, most significant country there, well, apart from China, of course, 1.5 billion. But look at Saudi Arabia, 1.8 billion. See, the thing is, if you want to keep wars going, you've got to make sure that both sides have all the toys. Yeah, there's no point in making sure that one side has the toys because then it'll be over too quickly. And then you lose the opportunity of the revenue stream. And this is exactly what happened, of course, in the Iran-Iraq war of 82 to 88, where the US was openly providing the hardware to Saddam Hussein, but then was providing an equal amount of hardware to Iran via drug money. This is the Iran-Contra situation, and Oliver North, the head of that, funneling the funds 
to the arms industry to get the arms industry to provide military equipment for Iran so that they could keep the war going. And it was only after six years where both Iran and Iraq said, well, hang on a goddamn second. You know, um, <laughs> we seem to be firing American shells at each other. What's going on here? And they called a halt to it and decided to go back because there, were, there wasn't really very much movement, they decided to go back to their pre-1982 borders. Well, the US, of course, needed conflict in the Middle East, so roll the clocks forward to 1991 uh, or 1990, where, of course, um, uh, April Glaspie, who was then the US ambassador to um, Iraq, tells Saddam Hussein that if he wants to invade Kuwait, basically get on with it, because we're not going to get involved. Yet. So this is how this stuff is stimulated. So these countries are well tooled up, thanks to a British arms industry that's being effectively forced to seek overseas markets because the traditional UK markets are dying. So where we're at right now, we've got... Today is the last day in which you can register to vote. Um, hopefully, hopefully, Jeremy Corbyn... And it's really more a vote for Jeremy Corbyn, I would say, than Labour. Really? I mean, that's, that's really, let's put this into perspective. Um, you know, because the Labour Party have demonstrated that the parliamentary Labour Party would actually like to remove Jeremy and have a Blairite in there. Because that's what the establishment wants. So, you know, what we're, where we're really at is, is there sufficient groundswell of support to put a guy into office that at least appears at this juncture to have something left of his moral compass and social conscience. Now, if they then try to remove him, I mean, they'll have to come up with something, you know, a bit more effective than the current rules of the Labour Party because they've already tried twice to remove him and he's uh, succeeded on remaining at the head of the party. So we're in a situation now where if we get the Tories back in power, then the whole game plan really does continue along the current vein, but at an accelerated pace. There's a lot of speculation that Theresa May will be pulled out of the prime ministerial role if the Tories get their expected, according to the mainstream media, they get their expected victory. And... Who they will put in there remains to be seen, but they will inevitably put somebody in there that is a safe pair of hands and can be relied upon to push through the corporatist agenda. And I would anticipate that within five years, we will see pretty much the total eradication of the NHS. We will see the privatisation of the police. Almost everything except the frontline police right now is G4S. In Lincolnshire, they actually have Lincolnshire police, G4S, on their lapels. This is the experiment. And they'll just push that out across the country. You know, we are going to see an acceleration of euthanasia or eugenics, the effective euthanasia of useless eaters. We had a crash in the NHS system a couple of weeks ago, yeah? And the NHS went into complete shutdown because their computer systems failed. So I called Nicola and I said, uh, you know, um, this computer system meltdown, I said, I'm reading that, you know, people have had their operations cancelled, people have been sent away with broken bones. So what do you do, tell their women that they can't have their babies? <laughs> and she said, well, of course not. She said, we've got, you know, backup systems. We've got manual backup systems for exactly that. She said, basically, everything's done, you know, manually, and then it's put into the computer. So one of two things occurred here. Either basically everybody who was affected got the instruction to just shut shop. Or we have lost the skills of maintaining hard copy records. And if that's the case, God help us. Consider the possibility that it was an experiment 
to see the likely effect of shutting down the NHS for just three or four days and how much we could accelerate the demise of useless eaters. How much we could remove the parasites from the welfare state. You know, Ian Duncan Smith ha has probably more blood on his hands even than Tony Blair, and that's saying something. But it's soft genocide, you know, because we, the number of people who are effectively proven to have died just a few weeks after being declared fit for work, when anybody in their right mind would know those persons weren't. Anybody here seen the film I, Daniel Blake? Okay, if you haven't seen it, you really need to see it. You really need to see it. People in the south of England, generally, and I'm, I'm making a general statement, obviously, but people in the south of England have no concept of the divide that still exists in this country. I mean, when George Osborne used to talk about the northern powerhouse, I think he was just talking about setting it alight. <laughs> yeah, just burning it, using it as fuel. Well, that's literally, yeah, metaphorically, perhaps. There is a massive divide. You know, we have a problem right across the country with things like zero hours contracts. We have a situation in the UK where people now have to work for six weeks without pay, lose or lose the benefits, and employers are saying, well, thank you, this is, like, this is better than slave labour. So what they're doing is they're taking people from the, uh, the DWP, doing their six weeks, uh, which is a trial period, and then they're basically saying, sorry, I'm not going to hire you. Next. Yeah. We have lost, lost all social conscience. You know, I mean, it's only 30 years ago, and in fact, in the 1980s, um, I, I was working with a general manager who had been with the company. It was a company that Schlumberger had acquired. And he had been with the company for 30 years. And he prided himself, he prided himself that his role was to maintain sound employment, sound continuous employment for 400, 500 people within the community. I mean, and so much so, I mean, he, you know, he knew pretty much the names of everybody who'd worked with the company for, less, for more than probably two, three years. And, but the people who'd worked with the company for 10 years or more, he knew the names of their, their wives and he knew pretty much every significant event that occurred in the family. Any general manager who took that approach today would probably get fired because he's lost sight of the bottom line. They've also lost their social conscience. Everything is about humanity being a commodity. We discovered, by the way, in, uh, in Lancashire, do you know what the term was during the public inquiry um, when uh, Quadrilla were presenting their evidence as to why they should actually be given permission to frack and they were having to justify the likely impact on you know, the, the air quality, the water quality, etc., etc. Do you know what term they were using for people or anything basically breathing or potentially breathing in this toxicity? Receptors receptors. And actually it took a little while. People who were monitoring the, the hearings kept hearing Quadrilla talking about, you know, well we've looked at the impact on these receptors and these receptors. And what, receptors? What the fuck is a receptor? And they realised that it, basically it's, it's people. It's people. You're a receptor. Nothing more than a receptor. And of course it's in the language. I mean, as I said right from the get-go, you know, the establishment works on the basis that they have to tell us what it is that they're doing. Not necessarily in words of one syllable, sometimes, yeah, it is. But, you know, I, I used to work, oh, God forbid, I, I can't even say the words now. But I hate the, I hate the words and I hate the phrase HR. <laughs> human resources, human resources. Now, when this term was coming in, I was, I, was, um, I was vice president of human resources for North America, except I wasn't vice president for human resources because I refused to accept that title. So I, I was still vice president for personnel. And my boss, who was the global vice president for human resources, said, Ian, you need to get with the times. 
Yeah, well, it was shortly after that that I decided I needed to get with the times and get out. <laughs> Human resources. You're a freaking commodity to be used, abused, and spat out as soon as there's no more use for you. Now, those of us here, and I'm, I'm being very generic, I appreciate, but those of us here, we are amongst the last generation to have some fundamentals in terms of basic skills and have had the opportunity to have full employment. That may have been not the case over the last few years, but to have full employment. And my father's generation was probably the last generation to have actually had the luxury, and I'll use the term loosely, of remaining with the same employer for their entire working life. And certainly my father's generation was the last generation where a man could work in an unskilled job and still have enough money to pay a mortgage or rent, to keep food on the table, and to probably provide a two-week holiday a year. Or three weeks, yeah. <laughs> two-week holiday a year on a basic salary without working overtime. I mean, my father was um, a, a lift maintenance engineer for the Greater London Council. He used to maintain the lifts in those low-rise social housing apartments all around South London. And I never knew him to work overtime or work weekends. And here was a guy, you know, it was a semi-skilled technician job. That's not possible today, you know? For the young generation, whether you're a midwife or, you know, a, 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 a young professional, you cannot survive on a single income. You know, both partners have to work. So that's why we're seeing that the average age at which a woman is giving birth is now in their late 30s. So their first child, sorry, I should have had that. The average age at which a woman is giving birth in this country to their first child is in their late 30s. But then we look at the ethnic communities and it's a slightly different situation. So we've got a lot going on and there's so many ways in which that we'll be under attack. And we are under attack. It's bio-spiritual warfare. There's an attack on the physiology and as we've seen, there's an attack on consciousness. And they're going, for, they're going for both. And most of us are just falling into it. So what are we going to do? Well, you know, there has to be some activism. There has to be community activism. You know, here we are at AV8, and I know there's you know, other similar events, and I know many of you are a lot more active today than you probably were a decade ago. The same is certainly the case with me. And this is what it's going to take, because the establishment doesn't care how much we know about what's going on. They really don't care, as long as we don't do anything about it. It's only when we start to do something about it that we become a problem for them. But we can talk about it as much as we like. You know, we can talk about it on social forums, and they'll monitor how much we're talking about it on social forums. And they've got the nudge units. You know, to make sure that, you know, we're gently nudged towards the mainstream narrative. We've got to get active. And it doesn't matter how we choose to get active, and there's so many different things to get involved in. No one person can get involved in all the stuff we need to address. But as has been observed during the course of the weekend, there's way more of us than there is of them. And unfortunately, they work on the basis that the more of us that they can keep in a state of apathy, then the more they're able to pursue their agenda. So I guess my apathy ended really about three years ago. Uh, maybe a bit longer. <laughs> but that was when, you know, through circumstances um, where, uh, some of you may know the story, but I was going to leave my apartment in um, South Devon and I was actually going to move into a beautiful apartment in a beautiful country house in Herefordshire. And uh, so I'd um, let the apartment go. I'd you know, organise the movers. And uh, I was going to move into this apartment in Bodenham Manor. Does that ring any bells, anybody? Yeah, Guy Taylor's. And so literally, literally a week before I was due to take 
uh, residents in the apartment on the top floor of Guy's Bowdoin Manor, the bailiffs came and took Bowdoin Manor. And Guy, of course, is still addressing that issue. Now, the good news for me was that I hadn't moved in, because that would have been a completely different ballgame. Well, at the time, we were just coming towards the end of the Barton Moss campaign against IGAS in, uh, on the outskirts of Manchester, and then we were moving to Crawberry Hill. And uh, so, you know, I had a caravan to stay in. So I thought, well, I've got a caravan, so I'm not going to rush to get an apartment. And you know what? The longer I don't have a fixed base, actually, the more I'm quite um, comfortable with it. You know, so the establishment regards me as NFA, no fixed abode. Right? Um, but, and there's other parts of the establishment that consider me to be homeless. I'm not homeless. Good God. I'm houseless. <laughs> I'm definitely houseless. And that's probably a situation that's going to continue for quite some time. So this is my home right now. There it is. <laughs> that wasn't the best of days this winter. This is a, a winter's morning on, um, at Kirby Misperton in, in North Yorkshire. And I'll show you that this was uh, actually the coldest day. Yeah, but to put it in perspective, that was the only time I saw snow and it had all gone by noon. So, you know... <laughs> I'm not really going for the sympathy vote. <laughs> and, you know, we have our visitors. This is the, uh, the bus. Of, I mean, unfortunately, they're not here this year, but um, Steve and Lisa, who were here last year, but uh, they're from Barnsley. And Kyle is uh, Lisa's son, and Kyle is the guy who does all the graphics for AV. And they come along to, uh, to visit, um, and they have this beautiful uh, converted l library, which they come and uh, stay on the, on the field. So that's our, uh, our camp. This is um, a more recent shot. This is an aerial shot that was taken for the Tour de Yorkshire, which went past the site uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, so, yeah, here's the camp. And this is where the landowner tried to uh, plough around us to block us in when we first arrived. And is Jeff in the room? Is Jeff? Jeff? No. Okay. Sorry, say again? Uh, that's Becca, that's his daughter, somewhere. OK, well, Jeff, I, I, I can talk about him then, <laughs> so without embarrassing him. Jeff, I, and this was the first day, this occurred on early in the morning, and it was the first day that I wasn't at the camp. So anyone would think they were monitoring my car, but hey, that would be, just be uh, rampant paranoia. Uh, anyway, at about 6 o'clock in the morning, the um, landowner's uh, representatives turned up with a tractor and a plough and started ploughing around the caravans and the... Well, it was only the caravans that we had on the site at that time. And uh, Jeff was sleeping in his Reliant... Not Robin, whatever it is, but his Reliant. And Jeff was actually parked just alongside the entrance. And the guys were literally backing the plough across the entrance to try to make sure that nothing could leave and nothing else could get on. And Jeff literally got out of his reliant and stood as the plough was backing, and he stood there as the plough backed right into his sternum. Now, I have to say that when the West, uh, North Yorkshire police turned up, the, the police in North Yorkshire thus far have been absolutely wonderful. And they told the uh, um, guys with the plough to basically take a hike, that we were there lawfully, because there was no gate on the field when we took the field, which under common law is an invitation to encroach, and uh, that there is a civil process that has to be undertaken to evict people who have effectively taken residence in the field and declared a Section 6. So the landowners... Uh, actually, we discovered that the owner probably didn't know anything about this, because the owner of this field is also the owner of Flamingo Land, Yorkshire's biggest tourist attraction. And uh, we discovered that the owner probably didn't know anything about this. And this was all done because two years ago, the owner had instructed his land manager to put a gate on this field. <laughs> uh, because had there been a gate on it, of course, it would have been a very different ball game. We would have, had we got into the field, it would have been aggravated trespass, which is a completely different situation. So the uh, agent, or the land manager, was trying to cover his own butt by getting us off before his boss found out about it. 
Anyway, um, there was a couple of other attempts to try and get us off, but eventually, you know, the police uh, made it clear that there was due process, and if there was any further harassment, the police would actually um, pursue uh, criminal charges against anybody who tried to remove us forcibly. This is really quite unique. This is North Yorkshire Police. So. <clears throat> anyway, through one of the local community, one of the members of the local community there, um, and this is a very, very conservative community, but we have a lot of support from the, uh, the local community here. And there's some people here. There's Heather and uh, Anna, yeah? And um, her regular supporters of the camp. Heather's actually camped there a couple of nights. And anyway, eventually, he set up a meeting between myself and the landowner, Gordon Gibb, the owner of Flamingo Land. And um, uh, Gordon Gibb had asked the chief superintendent of police to be there. So when I went along to the meeting, the first thing I did was ask him why the police were there when hopefully we were going to have a civil discussion about a civil matter. And uh, the police officer said, well, uh, actually, you know what, I'm just here at his invitation. I'm just here to make sure that whatever is agreed, both parties uphold. And I thought, OK, well, that's fine. I'm not going to agree to anything that we're not prepared to uphold. So, you know, we got the discussions underway. And I can honestly say I think it's the first time I've ever participated in any negotiation where I've been very conscious of the fact that the guy sitting on the other side of the table wanted to rip my throat out. Because we'd effectively, obviously, impacted upon his manhood by taking his field. He didn't need this field. The field hasn't been used for a decade. The soil's crap. The last usage of this field was as a motocross track. But it's a massive field. It's about uh, probably about eight, nine acres. So anyway, um, we had a fairly extensive discussion. And, um, of course, we are about a mile and a half from the village of Kirby Misperton here. There's nothing in the village of Kirby Misperton, no shop. There's a pub, but the landlord's not very friendly towards us, so we're not going to be going there anytime soon. So we've got no desire to have any unnecessary impact, negative impact, on the village or the local community. And uh, so I, my argument was that I thought we had shown remarkable social conscience and sensitivity to the local community by taking a field that hadn't been used for 10 years, hadn't got a gate across it, um, and effectively took us you know, off of the road so that we weren't causing any problems to his traffic, because he has something ridiculous, like about 20 million visitors a year. And they all have to come past the camp on the road there, which is effectively like a private driveway almost to, Curb to uh, Flamingo Land. And uh, the basis of the negotiation was, you know, I understand you really don't like us being on your field. And I'm really sorry about that. But with common land being eradicated in this country at a phenomenal rate of knots, we didn't have a lot of options. So I'm really sorry that we had to take your field. But if you evict us, you definitely ain't going to like plan B. <laughs> so without actually disclosing what plan B or C or D was, I think he understood that uh, basically we would inevitably be unintentionally perhaps, but a lot more disruptive if we were evicted from this field. So anyway, the bottom line is that we agreed we agreed that we would not extend the camp beyond the halfway mark in the field, which still gives us about four plus acres, which is a pretty sizable chunk of land. And uh, there's no time limit set. So provided we obviously do, you know, we behave appropriately within the community, we have a base here. And this, is, this location happens to be right at the very heart of the area in the north east of England that is being targeted for fracking. And what you saw Olsi present and the magnitude of the impact that that industry has had in Albania, don't think for one minute it won't be the same here. And this is a lot more densely populated than you know, the rural areas of Albania that were under attack. So, here we are, and um, this is where I'm going to be going back to after the camp, because as I told the judge recently, this is my primary residence. Um, and uh, I can recommend it. It's a great place to come camp. So if you're looking for something to do, and you want to get, you know, a toe into the water, as it were, in community activism, you could do a lot worse than come with a tent, not a caravan, 
because if we have any more caravans on site, we get classified as a traveller's site, and then we're subjected to a whole bunch of different legislation. So we have our five caravans, which is the limit. So now it's tents. We can have an unlimited amount of tents, and it's a great place to come spend a weekend and, uh, you know, go visit Flamingo Land and... <laughs> <laughs> or the other tourist attractions, because that's why we're there, to protect the indigenous industries. And as Max said, you know, I have to say that what goes through my head many, many times is, you know, uh, I am devoting so much time to this, and fortunately an increasing number of other people are, but I know that I'm actually not getting into some of the other stuff, and that's why I started doing Humanity vs. Insanity a couple of years ago now, to try and sort of maintain, you know, at least uh, a presence in the, in the bigger picture. So 90% of my time is spent on um, addressing the unconventional gas industry in this country, fracking. And yet, you know, 90% of my audience is effectively not related to the unconventional gas industry, it's the bigger picture. And that's a, it's a tough balance. But, um, you know, we are getting a lot of attention. That we're, this is a, a photograph that appeared in the Yorkshire Post. And so I showed that to someone, and they said, oh, so you've got rock band then? <laughs> I said, rock band? And they said, yeah, it looks like a bad cover off a bad sleeve off of a 1970s rock album. <laughs> Which I suppose it does, really. <laughs> anyway, they're a wonderful group of people. And something that shocks people who have never come into contact with any kind of activism, and in conservative North Yorkshire, that's quite a big chunk of the population. So what shocks people when they do eventually pluck up the courage to come and visit the camp is, first of all, the level of knowledge and awareness. You know, and, and the number of times that I've heard people say, oh, so you're not all swampies then? You know, it's the stereotyping that the media tries to uh, sort of put out to discourage people from actively engaging with the camp. So not only is there a phenomenal level of awareness, phenomenal level of knowledge, everybody on the camp is more than capable of educating or at least sowing the seeds and encouraging people, of course, to do their own research on what this industry is doing. And we have a government that is determined to destroy the ecology of this country. And it's not just the north of England, because this is Leith Hill right now. This is in an ancient forest between Dorking and uh, the village of Cold Harbour. And right now, this site has an eviction order on it. But it not only has an eviction order, because when the judge um, ruled that the camp should be evicted, he also ruled that anybody, anybody found supporting the camp from the local community would be held in contempt. So this is a clear attempt to effectively intimidate the local community from supporting the activists that are trying to help them prevent Europa, a gas company with zero experience of uh, fracking, from establishing a well site in the middle of an ancient forest. But held in contempt for supporting the camp. Well, the camp is still there, although the roadside element has gone because obviously uh, everybody who is staying in the camp now is inside the fortress. And it has some phenomenal defences, which I'm not going to discuss. <laughs> so it's good luck when they try and come along and, uh, and evict that camp. But this is a really, a, the camp was there to try and raise awareness with the local community. And it did actually achieve uh, a lot of success in that respect. And as I said on Friday, Unfortunately, the south of England, you know, my home county, is really difficult to get people to engage because they're all so heavily in debt. I mean, we are talking mortgages that would make your eyes water. You know, and they think that they, you know, they're well off. But you know, I was speaking to somebody who counsels people who have lost their employment, and he said, you know what, Ian? He said, there's people living in 2.5, 3 million pound houses. They're mortgaged up to the hilt, and they are actually just three salaries away from being homeless. Now, this is the fastest growing social movement this country's seen in a long time. 
And the establishment are doing everything they can to intimidate. Here's another level of intimidation. This is a protest pen. And this is what Lancashire Police and Quadrilla, who are building their well site here at Preston New Road, just outside Blackpool. And what they tried to do a few weeks ago, they, there was a, an event, this is at the um, end of February, there was an event there, and I caught wind of it, and there was a plan to invade the well site. And I, you know, I upset a few people when I went public, and I said the day before, whatever you do, do not invade the well site. Because if you invade the well site, you are going to provide the opportunity for Quadrilla to do exactly what they want, which is get another injunction on the well site. I said, don't give them that luxury. But unfortunately, 20-odd people did walk onto the well site, and two days later, Quadrilla in court, private session, and got the injunction stamped. But that was only temporary, pending a full hearing. Well, Quadrilla had to post the notices of the intended hearing and the intended um, restoration of the injunction, on the public area, and I was um, actually driving from Devon back to the north of England when I got a phone call from one of my colleagues here, and uh, he said, Ian, he said, I've just picked off the documentation stuck on the fences. He says it's a bundle that's about an inch and a half thick, and he said, and buried deep in there is a plan to establish a protest pen and to get the courts to approve it. And I said, well, we have to challenge it. And he said, um, yeah, how are we going to do that? I said, well, let's get a small team together and then we'll prepare the case and then we'll challenge it. He said, well, we haven't got time to get legal representation. So I said, well, who's the guy that's officially bankrupt? And <laughs> so working with a, a small team, and I have to say there's a, you know, wonderful people, and this was a, a combined team from people from Cheshire, from Lancashire, from, Nor uh, from Yorkshire, who worked through the weekend to prepare a defence against the protest pen. So when we went into court on the Monday, um, obviously we hadn't given any for, uh, forward announcement that we were going to do this. We turned up at the court with our submission and asked the judge permission to um, challenge the application for the protest pen. Well, the judge agreed, making it very clear that I was going to be liable potentially for any costs. So I'm like... <laughs> Anyway, um, he listened to what I had to say. He looked, you know, I mean, he hadn't had any chance to read the submissions because we literally submitted them sort of 30 minutes or so before the hearing was due to start. But he listened to what we had to say, and I made it very clear I wasn't there to challenge the injunction because that would have been pointless because 20-odd people had invaded the, the field. I said, but I was there to challenge this pen because, you know, we were able to recognise that if this had been established, it would have set a precedent for any any protest, not just anti-fracking, any protest. It would have created a precedent where the police in collusion with the corporation could have set up a protest pen. Now, what you can't see is that this is behind a hedge, tucked away, no one can see it. So, you know, you're allowed to protest. This is the equivalent in America of a free speech zone. You know, so you're allowed to protest, but only in here. So, anyway, um, the judge... Um, basically told me that uh, you know, he wasn't minded to separate the hearing on the pen from the hearing here. So if I wanted to uh, challenge, I had to challenge the whole thing. And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I said, because you know, that's clearly non-winnable. So I'm going to challenge this. Anyway, so this discussion went on for about an hour and a half or so. And in the end, he said, well, I'm sorry, but I'm going to uh, rule that unless you're prepared to challenge the whole thing, then, you know, I'm not going to hear it. And I said, look, let me just reiterate. I said, I'm making it very clear. My only objection is the pen. And he gave me another sort of five, ten minutes to summarize, you know, what I'd got in the documentation. Anyway, he said, no, I'm sorry, I made the decision. And I said, well, in which case, then I'm going to uh, seek leave to appeal. And he said, well, I'm not going to give permission to appeal. And I said, well, thank you very much, but um, I'd like leave to appeal. And uh, so he just smiled, and he knew damn well we would appeal. So anyway, I backed off, and then we went to lunch. When we came back after lunch, it was very, very clear that he read in full the 40-odd pages that we had put in our submission that we'd prepared over the weekend. And his whole attitude changed completely. Anyway, to cut a long story short, I'm pleased to say that the final ruling was that he upheld the application for the restoration of the injunction on the site and he rejected the application for the protest pen. Yeah. 
And then he turned to the quadrilla bar barrister and said, uh, now, um, costs. <laughs> and the, the quadrilla barrister stood up and said, um, on this occasion, sir, we do not seek costs. <laughs> and the judge turned to him and said, I think that's a wholly suitable decision. <laughs> Which is legal speak for you weren't going to fucking get any anyway. So. <laughs> <clears throat> so, that means that there, we can still protest on the street, because this is what they were trying to do. Basically, what they were going to do is, if they had established a protest pen, it would have meant that anybody standing here could be arrested under section, section 14 of the Public Order Act. In other words, we've set up an area where you can protest. So, you could quite legitimately protest there. So, we're not impact, impacting upon your human rights, because you can still protest. No one could see you, but <laughs> you can still protest. So this is, this is the magnitude of that ruling. So funnily enough, you're not going to read too much about it in the mainstream media, but you, you can certainly find it, obviously, online. So what's happened over the last few weeks is there have been a phenomenal number of lock-ons here. And in fact, uh, tomorrow I'll be leaving here to head up to Blackpool because we have the court case of the first lock-on there, four people who locked on right across the gate. They'll be found guilty because it's very evident, very evident that the judiciary in Lancashire have been told that what well, doesn't matter what you do, you find these people guilty. We had a case uh, a couple of weeks ago where basically the uh, judge said in his summing up, he said, well, despite the evident contradictions of the police evidence, I'm going to find him guilty. Uh, and I mean, everyone, I mean, yeah, it was exactly that. The public gallery gasped because, you know, it was probably just as well I wasn't in the courtroom. But uh, the gallery gasped because they'd sat through and obviously the judge had been seeing something completely different. So I have experienced more manhandling from the Lancashire police since the end of January this year than I have in the entire anti-fracking campaign to date. Because clearly, it's new rules for Lancashire Police. Now, I have to say that thus far, North Yorkshire Police have been a very different kettle of fish. I'm not expecting that to last, because if North Yorkshire Police continue to act in a wholly reasonable manner, which they've done to date, they will be pulled off the front line and Humberside Police will be put in there to do what <laughs> Lancashire Police are doing here. So where we're heading is the G4S police state. I mean, they're already tooled up with tasers and pepper sprays and everything else, and they wear the baseball caps, as you can see here. You know, gone are the Bobby's helmets that we saw in uh, Borkham, or the flat caps that we saw in Manchester. Now it's effectively the militarized police uniforms. And these level ones, you know, the police have level ones, level two, level threes. And we have a golden rule, because the police also have police liaison officers who wear blue bibs. And these are the officers that are supposed to be a liaison between the protest community, and the police. But they're actually forward intelligence gatherers. And anybody who speaks to them is effectively at risk of sharing information which will not necessarily be in the best interests of the activist community. So golden rule, just don't talk to them. There's only one question that you ever have to ask a British police officer, and that is, am I under arrest? Unless the answer is yes, you say, well, good day, sir, or ma'am, and just carry on walking. Am I under arrest? But these guys have taken it to a new level because they will physically manhandle you, throw you to the ground, do whatever it takes to get you out of the way. So we're seeing a, an, a massive increase in the level of gratuitous aggression. And this is inevitably going to get a lot worse, especially as Theresa May has basically stated in the manifesto that she's going to effectively push fracking through so that these companies will not even have to apply for planning permission to drill exploratory wells. And just to put it in perspective, and I'm going to just focus on the north of England here, that is the area of the north of England. If you live in any of these areas, right up the eastern Pennines, right across to northeast Lincolnshire, right up to edge of the North York Moors. And by the way, here, here is one of the most prolific gas fields in the UK, not currently licensed. This is the Eskdale gas field. And on a different note, we're working with some people there who have been suckered into 
securing their properties on bullshit business investment so that the gas companies can, and the banks can take possession of their properties, sitting, sitting over the top of the Eskdale gas field. Not yet licensed, but will be. We have another problem, which is a company called Ineos, which is um, based up in uh, Grangemouth in Scotland. It's a, a Swiss company, headed up by a guy called Jim Ratcliffe. He is one of the wealthiest people in this country. Ineos is a private company. Jim Ratcliffe's personal wealth is listed at around about 5.5 billion pounds. He's just got permission to build a property on Jack's, on Sandbanks in Dorset. When he was asked why it was on Jack's, he said, so that I can lift the house when the sea levels rise. So he still believes in the climate change bullshit. So. <laughs> anyway. But that, this is the area of the north of England that's under attack. And you know, right through here, the area, where, oh, sorry, the area where we are right now is a Boolean aquifer that <laughs> provides Scarborough with all its water. And if that aquifer is uh, in any way contaminated, then basically Scarborough will become uninhabitable. And you saw what happened in Albania. So don't think for one minute it isn't going to happen here. But, you know, there are success stories. And I, had, I did talk about this, I think, briefly last year, but it's worth reiterating. You know, you guys are a very, very powerful community. And particularly the elder element. And this is a term of endearment. This is what these people in East Yorkshire call themselves, the Jerry Activists. <laughs> the Jerry Activists. This is John and Balmaga. John is the former Director of Education and Children's Services for East Riding Council. His wife, Val, is a former teacher. They were the first two people to be arrested at uh, Crawberry Hill in East Yorkshire. Uh, ultimately, all charges were dropped, so, but you know, it was the intimidatory arrests. But they were prepared to put themselves on the line. You know, this guy here is Mike Farmer. He's uh, a former NASA engineer, 20 years with NASA. And these guys, there's about a dozen of them or so, and every time a truck went into the well site at Crawberry Hill, they would go and stand in front of the gates. And the police didn't want to arrest them because these are all fine, upstanding members of the community and it wouldn't go down too well in the local press. And it would draw a lot of attention. And Rath and Energy didn't want them arrested for the same reason. And uh, you know, I got some great video footage of the police actually turning up when these guys are across the uh, gate. And um, the police uh, inspector says, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so how long are we planning to uh, stay here today? And they look at each other and dusk <laughs> and he went okay <laughs> and so they just all stood around chatting until dusk and then at dusk they let the truck out well they did this they did this after the camp was arrested and of course this is the piece of real estate that uh, Rathlin tried to get the 55,000 pounds from me for um, because this was evicted when we built that in front of uh, the entrance um, so once that was evicted, we moved the camp to the side of the road. Once that was evicted, that was when the local community realised they had to become self-empowered because there was nobody there, nobody there to prevent the gas industry from going into this well site. They recognised that you know, many of the other people, the younger generation, obviously had family responsibilities, had jo jobs. These were retirees with a degree of financial independence. So once the, uh, they witnessed this eviction, this is um, the uh, UK High Court's eviction team. Yeah. Some of them can just about string a sentence together. And this is the Jerry Activists. And for seven months, they blockaded every single vehicle that went into that well site. And on August the 12th, 2015, Rathlin Energy announced that they were pulling out of this well site and would return the land to its former agricultural glory, which it is today. <laughs> this is a local community, right? And the anti-fracking community is, is based on what I refer to as a fracking fractal. You know, a fractal a key repeat of a structure, like a snowflake, you know, and just keep building on it. No hierarchy, no leadership whatsoever, just encouraging communities to take total responsibility for effectively protecting their communities. And the establishment has no idea how to deal with it. You know, so what we're creating is effectively the hydra. You know, so you cut one head off and two more appear. You know, and that, so right now, 
there's, I reckon, close to a thousand anti-fracking groups, communities around the country. And uh, I think I mentioned um, yesterday that, you know, one of the groups in South Yorkshire has set up a campaign called Do Your Street. And it was a bit like taking Adrian's um, idea as he presented in the open mic yesterday. Do Your Street. So the South Yorkshire group, they pr printed, you know, literally thousands of these leaflets. And all you've got to do is phone them up, tell them where you live, tell them your postcode, tell them how many leaflets you want. They'll send you the leaflets. And your agreement is that you will knock on doors, not just put them through a letterbox, but you'll knock on doors and chat to people about the unconventional gas industry. So you know, we've got a long way to go. But this is an example of what community activism can achieve. You know, no hierarchy, no structure. The establishment knows very, very well how to deal with hierarchical structures. And maybe it's a good point. Anyone remember um, Fathers for Justice? Yeah. Fathers for Justice, yeah. Well, back in, um, back in, when was it, 2004? Here we go. That's when they hit the headline because the dad's group hit Tony Blair with purple flower during Prime Minister's questions. What a shame it was only flower. <laughs> anyway, this obviously somewhat frustrated Tony Blair, but Fathers for Justice were getting a lot of traction with their very creative campaign, you know, dressing in superheroes outfits and getting up Big Ben and getting on London monuments and getting good press coverage for Fathers for Justice who were seeking access to children after a failed relationship. Well, do you know how, can you remember how Fathers for Justice was destroyed? No? I know it's going back over a decade. Fathers for Justice was having tremendous effect and then all of a sudden it disappeared. And the reason it disappeared was because they were set up, they were infiltrated, and they were set up, and the guy who set them up got the leadership together, and in a pub, they discussed kidnapping Tony Blair's youngest son, Leo. Aww. And of course, it was a total setup, and literally, literally, within 24 hours, some of the media were actually questioning, hey, what? You know, this was a group of guys sitting in a pub and one of them makes a joke about kidnapping Tony Blair's son. Oh, well, was it a joke? Because he just happened to be recording it at the same time, passing it to the media. Obviously, Middle England is <gasps> outraged. And all of a sudden, Fathers for Justice is no more. New, so now we have new Fathers for Justice, but it's taken them over a decade to... Um, get back on track. And one of the advantages, you see, of having no hierarchy, no structure, is that, uh, you know, it makes it a lot more difficult to infiltrate. I mean, I'm not suggesting for one moment that the anti-fracking community isn't infiltrated. In fact, I know it is. But it can be contained. Because once you realise that you've got a problem, you just say, OK, fine, leave them to it. You know, effectively isolate them. And we stay vigilant. And obviously, we've been going long enough to know who you can trust and who maybe you need to just be a little bit more careful of. I mean, my philosophy is I trust absolutely everyone until such time as they give me reason to call that into question. And obviously, we know that they do this because we, you know, we know that they undercover police officers have literally got into relationships with, with women, had children with women, you know, whilst actually married elsewhere. And uh, some of those women are still seeking compensation, and not too surprisingly, some of them are, uh, you know, extremely distraught and still suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. So, you know, we have to be very sensitive to what's occurring. Anyone know where Topaz petrol stations are based? Ireland. Yes. How many, how many Topaz petrol stations are there outside North, uh, uh, Ireland? One. The Republic, yes, one. Do you know where it is? Yes, absolutely. 50 metres across the border. It's on the Belfast Dublin Road. The reason that these uh, gas stations, petrol stations, are in Southern Ireland is because uh, about a decade, not quite a decade ago, um, the population of Ireland rose up against Shell because Shell was trying to build a refinery in a beautiful part of uh, County Mayo. And uh, as was later discovered, the Gardaí, the Irish police, were actually on the Shell payroll, brutalising the local community. 
And I, I was giving a series of presentations in Ireland about six years ago called The Pillage of Ireland's Resources, which was remarkably similar to a lot of the stuff that uh, Olsi was sharing with us yesterday. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Moira. I, uh, I can't remember her family name, but she was a school teacher. And uh, she was a lady who chained herself to the gates and then was brutalized by the Gardaí, which led to the outrage of the Irish population. And, I mean, she was in her 60s, at least, when I met her, and she's about this high, as frail as anything. And you think, my God, you know, what kind of mentality is it that brutalizes a lady like this? And then, of course, we discovered that the Gardaí were on the show of payroll. They had been given permission by the Irish government to effectively wear their uniforms but acting as private security contractors. Oh, that's another definition of a fascist state. Anyway, Shell was losing a lot of downstream revenue because the population of Ireland was so outraged by the behaviour of Shell and their agents, the Irish police, that they boycotted Shell petrol stations. And any time people saw a car drive into a, a Shell petrol station, other cars would drive in and say, what are you doing? These are the people that are brutalising, you know, the people in County Mayo. And so Shell had to go through a massive rebranding exercise. Oh. <laughs> and now, now when you drive into these stations, you will actually find little Shell logos because they're starting to sort of creep back and say, do you forgive us yet? Do you forgive us? <sighs> so, uh, yeah, these are Shell petrol stations. But, you know, even now, I think I mentioned this. Did I mention this in Ireland, Trevor, when I was there? Because even now there are people who still don't know the history of the Topaz petrol stations in Ireland. But yet again, it's another example of what a sustained community, activist community, can achieve. So never, ever fall into the trap of saying, and I know you wouldn't, but never, ever fall into the trap of saying, but what can you do? What can you do? I mean, I've heard that so many times over the last few years. And, you know, my response is the same. That's exactly what they want you to think. Exactly. And you're just falling into that trap. They don't care. As long as you don't get involved. So let me just uh, try and um, pick up on a few points from uh, the weekend and, and put it into some perspective here. Um, I just want to touch on, you know, the diesel cars are being demonised at the moment. And um, you know, whilst I'll acknowledge that... <laughs> The diesel fumes are, uh, you know, not conducive, uh, but, you know, then don't stick your head up the exhaust. Um, pollution is a problem, there's no question, and I absolutely concur with peers that the whole climate change issue is to keep people away from addressing the, the real cause. Just keep people focused on something that's way out here, so big that they can never actually grasp it, as opposed to addressing the real problem. But there's another issue with... Um, uh, this diesel issue, and that is the fact that despite the fact that technology has been around since 1975, where every petrol vehicle on the road should be returning well over 100 miles a gallon, it's called lean burn technology. And actually when it was being marketed back in the 1970s, the British government got the AA, which was quite a powerful group back in the 1970s, to lobby all their members and tell them not to embrace this lean burn technology because it would damage your engine. Why does the government do that? Because it needs the taxation on your fuel. And as more and more people are moving to electric or hybrid vehicles, what's happening is the government is losing taxation revenue on hydrocarbons. Has anyone got a diesel vehicle here? Yeah? Okay, why do we drive diesel vehicles? because you get greater fuel economy, uh, probably about as much as 40%, right? Which means that the British establishment is losing, in its perverse mind, 40% of taxation revenue. Every vehicle on British roads is very carefully calculated to return an average of 35 miles a gallon. Bear in mind what I said, lean burn technology, 40 years ago, should mean that every vehicle on the roads today, every petrol-driven vehicle is returning well over 100 miles to the gallon. Deliberately suppressed to ensure that you keep buying this fake scarcity product to get the taxation. And now as people move to electric cars and hybrids, they're losing that revenue, so they want to get that revenue back, so let's demonize diesel cars. 
It's a massive part of it. This is um, from a few years ago now, about seven years ago, I think, actually. And this is the Volkswagen revealing their 300 miles per gallon coupe. And this is based on an apprenticeship project. Every year, Volkswagen apprentices, their final year apprentices, yeah, they still have apprenticeships in Germany. Every uh, year, the final year apprentices set the task of improving upon the previous year's apprentices in getting better fuel economy from a one liter engine. One liter engine. And um, right now, it's up to 300 miles a gallon for a one liter engine. Now, obviously, that's aerodynamic, it's stripped out and everything else. But, you know, you get, you get the picture. Even if, it, if once you've got a normal family car, it's 150 miles a gallon. It's a damn sight more than 35 or whatever it is you're getting from an average petrol vehicle in this country today. Now, in the US, when Volkswagen took this vehicle on, on tour, and to the fanfare of Volkswagen develops a 300 miles per gallon vehicle. Well, the US media took a completely different slant on it. So what they did is um, they said that uh, they went, witnessed the tests, 300 miles a gallon. <laughs> but their media said, Volkswagen lie. Vehicle only returns 260 miles a gallon. <laughs> All right. What's the difference between a US gallon and an imperial gallon? Four fluid ounces per pint. So 32 fluid ounces per gallon. Yeah? So the, a US pint is 16 fluid ounces. An imperial pint is 20 fluid ounces. So actually, the difference was solely the difference in the calculation of a gallon based on imperial versus um, uh, US measurements. But of course, that's not the spin. So basically, they wanted to demonize it even though it was still getting 260 miles a gallon, but they want to demonize it by saying that Volkswagen, you know, weren't uh, living up to their expectations. And of course, we have this vehicle, which when it was um, announced uh, three years ago, <coughs> guess what? I made the observation that this would never, ever see the light of day. How many of you have heard of this? No. A saltwater powered vehicle. Well, we know that saltwater powered vehicles have been around basically since the 1980s. And of course, the most famous one is Stanley Myers, who was sequestered by the US government because they wanted to allegedly develop military vehicles run on saltwater. And um, he, you know, did go along to have a meeting with them. And they gave him a glass of champagne, and the toast was to water-powered fighting vehicles. He took a sip of the champagne. We know this because his brother was there, and his brother tells the story. He took a sip of the champagne, and he collapsed and died. And obviously, the technology went with him, except that it re-emerged uh, three years ago. 271-mile-an-hour vehicle, powered by salt water, approved for European roads. But you ain't ever going to see it because the hydrocarbons industry and the governments will shut it down. One of the reasons we see smart motorways, by the way, anytime you hear the word smart in front of something, of course, it ain't smart for you or me. Smart motorways are part of the plan to start the uh, end of reliance on fuel purchases for taxation. Because as we move to electric or hybrid vehicles, obviously fuel consumption, hydrocarbon consumption is going to go down. So they've got to find another way to tax. So what's coming is taxation per mile driven. Already being experimented with in the US, taxation per mile driven. It'll be real time because every vehicle is going to have to have a tracker device. And at the end of every month, based on whatever mileage you've driven, then your account will be deducted by said amount. Now, right now, you pay that tax, obviously, every time you go to the pump. Okay, so, you know, you, if you're paying, let's say, a pound 15 or whatever for a, a, ga a litre, a litre, a gallon, I wish, if you're paying one pound 15 a litre of fuel, you know, basically, that you're paying, and let's say you get, um, let, let's say you get 10 miles per litre, you know that you're paying, effectively, 7p in taxation for every mile you drive. But you may not realise that because you're just paying it uh, as part of the fuel cost. But what's coming is that that 7p a mile, or whatever it is, will simply be deducted from your bank account at the end of the month based on how many miles you've driven. And if there ain't enough money in your bank account, guess what? 
your car won't start. <laughs> and it's coming. You know, within 15 years, the number of manual driven vehicles on the road is likely to be greatly reduced. And then we're going to have this real issue of automatic vehicles. What do they call them? Autonomous driven vehicles um, versus the uh, manual driven vehicles. You know, we've heard about this, obviously, this is the global control grid. And this is from the, you know, the Daily Mail. We'll be uploading our minds to computers, and this is obviously exactly what Graham was touching on. But look at the, you know, this is from four years ago. And once again, it's the establishment telling you, telling you exactly what's occurring. And by the way, um, those of you who uh, are going to participate in Judith's workshop, she's actually written a book called Letters to the Cyborgs, because Judith has done quite a lot of work on artificial intelligence. And obviously she hasn't had the opportunity to discuss that through the weekend, but uh, I know a number of you have bought uh, that book, but I think in her workshop this, after, this morning, whenever, she's going to be uh, introducing you to her insights into artificial intelligence, and her book is says, Letters to the Cyborgs. So here we are, we're being told, and of course Hollywood, I can't remember the name of the film, but it was a Johnny Depp film, I think. Transcendence. Transcendence, that's it, where Johnny Depp's consciousness is uploaded into the, uh, the supercomputer. And, uh, you know, is this... Yeah, the lawnmower man, didn't he? The lawnmower man, exactly. So, you know, it's all out there. And this was the, mag the front cover of Time magazine. And this is, again, you know... Um, basically, I think this came from Ray Kurzweil. You know, Ray Kurzweil, I, I, um, Graham alluded to this, but Ray Kurzweil was just regarded in the sort of 90s as, uh, you know, a visionary, but a bit of a nutter you know, with some of the things that he was forecasting. Anyway, of course, a few years ago, he was appointed director of technology for Google. So now he literally has unlimited funds to pursue his perverse vision. Now, that, you're right, that was the film, wasn't it? Transcendence, yeah. And, you know, we talk about the, the um, androids. This is, again, from a few years ago. In Japan... They are now experimenting with human-robot relationships. Yeah, and this is from the Daily Mail again in Australia. The hyper-real robots that will replace receptionists, pop stars, and even sex dolls, unnervingly human androids coming to a future very near you. Incredibly lifelike robots are currently causing a storm in Japan, where they are being prepared for mass commercialization. And the proposition here, the proposition is that these um, sex bots, yeah, you can program them. So depending on, you know, what type of partner you, you crave, whether you want, you know, submissive or Spectrum. dominance, yeah, you know, you can program it, you know? Now I can see some... No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, is it that time of the month? Tick! And, you know, the, so what we're seeing is robots being given human rights. <coughs> it is not inconceivable, said an Orient industry spokesman, that we will be making Android life partners in the near future. David Levy, author of Love and Sex with Robots, predicts that as robots become more sophisticated, growing numbers of adventurous humans will enter into intimate relationships with these intelligent robots. I wouldn't use the word adventurous. <laughs> I would use something like sad gits, basically. <laughs> Speaking at the first international conference on human-robot personal relationships held last week, he says that AI will progress to the point where human-robot dating will be commonplace. It's in your face. Literally. Equal rights for anthropomorphic automatons. This is the guy creating... Oh, is that, wasn't it some, some, didn't somebody else create man in his own image? <laughs> you know, here we've got the creation of bots in their own image. And, you know... Now, Graham touched on it, and I have certainly touched on it in the past. This is the technocracy agenda. It goes right back to 1932. You know, if you haven't read 
the Technocracy Inc. document, written in 1932 by Marion King Hubbard and Howard Scott, founding member of the Club of Rome. If you haven't read this document, read it, because it's, it, it's just fascinating. Because back in 1932, they had the vision, but they didn't have the technology. Now, they have the technology. And they're advancing in that direction at a phenomenal rate. You know, this is the guy... Whoop, it isn't. This is the guy who read Technocracy Inc. and effectively rewrote it in this document, book, Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era. Download it. I mean, now that it's, it's available as a PDF, but a few years ago, these books were changing hands at well over two, three hundred pounds a piece because people were realizing that this is the blueprint for everything that is uh, starting to unfold. He wrote this in 1969. It was actually this book that brought him to the attention of the Rockefellers. He had Rockefeller funding from the moment this book was published. He then went on to found the Trilateral Commission just four years later in 1973. And this agenda is being pushed through the likes of the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberger Group. Let me just show you a couple of quotes More directly linked to the impact of technology, it involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled and directed society. Such a society would be dominated by an elite whose claim to political power would rest on allegedly superior scientific know-how. Unhindered by the restraints of traditional liberal values, this elite would not hesitate to achieve its political ends by using the latest modern techniques for influencing public behavior and keeping society under close surveillance and control. In the technotronic society, the trend seems to be towards aggregating the individual support of millions of unorganized citizens who are easily within the reach of magnetic and attractive personalities and effectively exploiting the latest communication techniques to manipulate emotions and control reasons from 1970s. Everything is occurring right now. But Zbigniew Brzezinski himself acknowledged one thing, and this is a few years ago. He made two presentations within a very short time of each other. In the first one, he said, the biggest obstacle to establishing the one world government is the rapid political awakening of the masses. A few weeks later, he made a similar comment, but he added something very telling. He said, the biggest obstacle to establishing the one world government is the rapid political and spiritual awakening of the masses. It's a very, very telling observation. And everything that you've heard this weekend is really about shutting down the potential access to that wider connect, to keep everybody on the treadmill. The power of debt. Somebody said the pen is mightier than the sword. It sure is, especially when it's on a mortgage, mortgage, death grip, document. Because they work on the basis that you know, that's why they're realizing that the Jerry activists are a powerful community. So let's raise the retirement age. Let's reduce pensions. Let's make sure that the Jerry activist community never gets a chance to become active because we'll work them until they drop or we'll kill them quietly through multiple means, you know, whether it's the pharmaceutical industry. Fluoride in the water. Yeah, the care pathways. Don't you love that term? But something is happening. Something is happening. And you know what? I, I was explaining to somebody earlier, I, I work very much on an organic basis. You know, I've learned a long time ago that you try and over-engineer something and basically it ain't going to work. Something's going to go wrong and you're going to be really disappointed. So just let it flow. Just get out there with the organic. And... One of the reasons that you know, we focus very much at alternative view events is on the pragmatics, because I acknowledge, recognize, and accept that the vast majority of people in AV audiences have that spiritual connection. Don't you? Yes. Yes, yes you do. And I um, woke up on, I think it was uh, Thursday or Friday morning, and um, when I was in the sort of latter stages of preparing for this. And I met with Kelly later on in the day, and I said, you know what, Kelly? I said, I had a really unusual experience this morning. I said, unusual for me. 
And she said, well, what was that? I said, I had a panic attack. And I said, you know, I can't even remember the last time I experienced anything like that. Anyway, so I reflected on this. Why did I have a panic attack? I mean, there was no need to have any panic attack. I mean, obviously, you know, a little bit of stress and getting stuff together, but there was no need to enter into any, oh, nothing different from any other event. Why did I have that? And as I sort of sat and reflected on this, I realized what I had suddenly experienced and I needed to experience it was what people who don't have that spiritual connect have to deal with on an ongoing basis. Because let me tell you, for about half an hour, I was fucking lonely. I mean, really lonely, which I, even when I'm on my own, I'm never lonely. You know, and I know that you know exactly what I'm talking about here. You know, we have a lot of help, a lot of help. We can't explain it in reductionist Newtonian terms, but we can't deny it either because it's experiential and every one of you has had those experiences. And whilst I certainly wasn't conscious of it, you know, when I look back through my 60 years in this planet, but, you know, the first 40-odd years, I mean, holy, I look back and I think, how the hell did that happen? How the hell did that happen? And I know you've all had exactly the same. You've all had exactly the same. You look back at stuff and you think, my God, you know, God, right place, right time, doesn't even come into it. And you've all had that because it's natural, it's normal. And the establishment wants to shut it down and make anybody who dares to raise this subject uh, you know, potentially um, a threat to society and needs to be sectioned. And this is what the establishment is trying to shut down. It's trying to get everybody back into that lonely state where you are reliant on the establishment and their control grid to be able to effectively live your life. So it is shutting down, shutting down our connection to the right brain. You know, and, it, and I give full credit, it was Tony Wright who first you know, triggered my research into, uh, into this, but you know, the, the human brain is not a single organ. You know, Thomas alluded to it and said, you know, consciousness isn't the brain, it's much more than that. It is, we don't really know. Yeah? We can only surmise while we're here, but it's two organs. The left brain, which is the receiver, transmitter, to this physical, empirical, material, three-dimensional realm. And it needs sleep. Yet Tony, Jill Bolte-Taylor, and others who, for varying reasons, have managed to shut this side of the brain down and effectively see or establish a worldview through the right side of the brain have a totally different perspective. It's that connect. I know you all know, I mean, there are many times that you, you want to know something and you ask a question and you throw the question out there, and then you forget about it, but within two or three days, you get the answer, don't you? Yeah, yeah it's normal. Yeah. But why, why isn't this taught in schools? Because they don't want you to know this. They don't want you to know that there's a force out there that you can tap into and, you know, make your life a little different. Somebody was asking me the other day, you know, how I managed to do what I do, and, uh, you know, how I get the finance. And, I mean, obviously, I have some, you know, wonderful support, you know, physical, empirical, material, of course, but there's obviously other support, because I have literally been in situations where I'm committed to be at a particular location, and I don't even have the money to get the fuel to get there. But I don't worry about it. I never have the panic attack, because I absolutely trust, through experience, that in some way, shape, or form, by the time I'm ready to set off, something's going to happen, the funds will arrive, and I'll be able to get where I need to get to. You, you've all experienced something like this, yes? It's normal. There's nothing special about this whatsoever. It is natural humanity. And the establishment is scared shitless of it. Because it would seem that there's a significant element of the establishment who present themselves as human. But it would seem that they do not have this capacity. And because it's something they can't control, they're desperately trying to block it. So, you, know, you have this connect, practice it more and more. You know, open yourselves to whatever is out there, because it is benign. Some people might refer to it as magic. Well, maybe it is, if you like. But, you know, and it's the same force that everybody else has access to. What perhaps differentiates us from the other side is how we're going to use it. 
Because obviously the one thing that I'm sure you also realise is that if you abuse it, it ain't going to be around for very long. You know, it's like everything. The more you practice, and the more appropriate you make use of it, the more you're going to experience it. And the establishment have no idea how to deal with it. So they're trying everything they can. Vaccinations, fluoride in the water, GMO foods, geoengineering. That's just the, the start, you know? The drug companies, the pharmaceuticals. And the quicker they can get you onto the revenue stream for pharmaceuticals, the more chance they've got of actually shutting this down. And, you know, this was brought home to me a few years ago now, where I was giving a presentation at the Theosophical Society, which is not a usual venue for me, but the Theosophical Society in Cardiff. And I was, obviously it was a Theosophical Society meeting, so I felt more comfortable about discussing such uh, material. Anyway, so I was talking about this, and uh, really, I barely got into it, and then the guy stood up at the back and said, Mr. Crane, that's bollocks! And I said, well, you know, maybe, it, maybe it is uh, for you. Perhaps it is. But then everybody else in the room was like, you know, shh, 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 give, him a, give him a chance, give him a chance. Anyway, so I carried on, and he made a couple more interjections, and the audience were dealing with him. And, uh, but then I got into the way in which pharmaceuticals, particularly SSRIs, serotonin, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, you know, antidepressants and for children, the likes of Ritalin and Zoloft, and how these drugs are being over-prescribed to literally shut down that connect. Anyway, he went very quiet, and afterwards he came up to me and he said, I really want to apologise for my outburst. He said, but you've actually answered my question. And he said, you know what? He said, I am from this point forward going to make every effort I can to get off the medications that I've been prescribed for the last 20 years. So I'm an optimist, very much an optimist. And I know, I know some people have some difficulty with the way in which I have my worldview, but I'm going to share it with you. We are here for 28,000 days, give or take. 28,000 days. Much of that is spent acclimatizing. Right? It's called infancy. And do you remember, getting adjusted to this physical realm is a real pain in the head because you get bumping it. You know, adjusting to this sort of physical arena where you couldn't actually walk through stuff <laughs> was tough. So you go through infancy, childhood, adolescence, young adulthood. And then, you know, because you've been conditioned, you spend probably the next 14 years or so, 21 years even, fully embraced in the system, as I was. I was a late developer. I was held by the force <laughs> until I was 41. And that was the time I really started to, you know, pull out. I mean, I guess I always knew it was there, but I was too sucked in. I was too vested in the corporate world. So I moved away at 41. So, you know, I spent a, more than half of my 28,000 days acclimatizing. But then, the realisation, OK, you've got to, what's left of your 28,000 days. This is a hell of a university. This really is a university. And you all came here with the raw materials of the skills that you needed, the knowledge that you needed to do whatever it was that you basically tasked yourselves with to learn or contribute while you're here. And I know there's not a single person in the room, I'm sure, who thinks that everything that you've learned while you're here is then lost. Do you? No. Yeah? We don't know what happens to it. We can't know that. It's ineffable, unknowable, while we're in this physical, empirical, material realm. So to, you, to learn, you know, there's, an, there's an adage in sport that says that you only improve when you're playing against opponents that are better than you. Same with any game. The only way in which you improve at a game, say chess, the only way in which you improve is actually by playing against people that are better than you. Our opponents in this game are very, very capable. They're not particularly creative, but they're very capable. They're very well organized because they have a hierarchical structure which they understand how it works, and they know how to deal with any other hierarchical structure. So when they're thrown something like an organic structure with no hierarchy, 
They have no idea really how to deal with it. So we're learning. We're learning how to play. You know, I actually share Max's philosophy to some extent. On a selfish basis, on a selfish basis, the outcome will be the outcome. The outcome will absolutely be the outcome. And, you know, we will learn from participating in the process of whatever that outcome ultimately is. But then, when we actually take a look at the longer game, and we recognize that we are a generation, as every generation, that has a responsibility for the legacy that we leave the next generation. And the legacy that we're leaving the next generation just doesn't bear thinking about, does it? Raising a cyborg? Or a transhumanist baby that's been bred in an external birth shell? It doesn't bear thinking about. So, it's pretty obvious what the establishment is planning. It's been spelled out for us. It's pretty much a blueprint. Most people don't read it, but you have. You have an insight into what that blueprint is. And now you have, quite possibly, the most significant opportunity to contribute to how this unfolds that any generation has ever had. Because you have a level of awareness, you have access to the tools, at the moment anyway, the internet, you have the access to the tools to be able to establish your own perspective on what's unfolding and come to your own determination and your own decision as to how you're going to participate in the game as it goes forward. Are you going to sit back and watch the transhumanist agenda roll into play? Are you going to sit back and watch the country's water supplies destroyed so that we're reliant on the likes of Nestle, the corporations, over the next few years? Are you going to sit back and watch employment disappear? Because within 15 years, it's estimated that 80% of all unskilled male employment will disappear. All unskilled male employment will disappear. Truck drivers, thing of the past. Engineers, technicians, apart from the top end, thing of the past because it'll all be automated. They're already seeing it in cashiers. How many people use self-service checkouts? Because if you do, you're contributing to the demise of employment for people who need part-time employment or need flexible employment you know, because they've got other family responsibilities. The establishment is preparing to get rid, and he's already doing it, of people that cannot contribute directly to the corporatocracy. We have an opportunity to participate in the short term. That's trying to perhaps, I wouldn't say get the Labour Party into power, but get Jeremy Corbyn into a position. Now, if he gets, if he gets pulled out, or he welshes, or is forced to welsh on his commitments, then that opens up a whole other agenda. But at least we know what the deal is. Because unless Jeremy Corbyn does get a chance, we'll never know. And if he isn't in office on June the 9th, then we pretty much know where we're going, and we have to accelerate, I think, our participation to shut down what's occurring. Now, never forget that, you know, we do have a lot of help, and it's going to come from, I don't know, incredible quarters. Who, who can explain it? But we know we've got a lot of help. I mean, I call it intuition. <laughs> you know, people say to me, what, what, you know, what's your plans, Ian? The left brain needs plans. I'm sorry if I uh, offend anybody here, but anybody that has a diary where you've got in your diary what you're doing every sort of 10, 15 minutes of the day, that's the left brain. You're in the left brain control because the left brain needs to know. It needs to have this structure. You know, the right brain is more than comfortable to live outside that. The left brain won't allow it. You, know? you need the left brain. You need the ego. It's an absolutely core part of our experience. But it needs to be a team player. And once the ego realizes and acknowledges that the right brain has capacities and capabilities which the left brain cannot even begin to comprehend whilst we're in this physical environment, but it can't deny the experiences either. And once it embraces that opportunity to access everything that's out there, then what is possible is way beyond our current comprehension and certainly way beyond anything the establishment can dream up. So I'm an eternal optimist. 
You know, I'll, uh, the, only, the only plan I have right now, by the way, is one, to be in court to support the people that um, were arrested on uh, J January 31st for the first lock-on at Preston Road, and I'll be in court on Wednesday. And the only other plan I have is uh, somehow to uh, attend my daughter's wedding in Mozambique. Um, I, I was going to show you a slide because uh, she actually sent, sent me a, a link to a website and um, she told me she was getting married. And then she said, Dad, can you take care of this for me? And, and you'll find this, just search for it. But it was a website that offers uh, geoengineering to guarantee good weather for your wedding. <laughs> I, I promise you, this is a British company. It's a British company. It, I think it's called Weather Action. No, no, it's somebody else. Uh, it's 100,000 pounds a pop, by the way. So I did suggest that it was slightly out of my budget. And she said, I thought you'd say that. That's why I'm getting married in Mozambique. <laughs> And then the only other plan I have is to be back here on the first weekend of May next year for AV9. So thank you so much for sharing the weekend with us. And uh, let's do what needs to be done. And if I've timed that rightly, the alarm should go about 